Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. I know it's a very tough uh, uh, task to entertain you after lunch, but I hope I'll be able to make you not sleep after, uh, during the session. And today we're going to talk about revisiting effective Java. How many of you have read uh, any of the editions of the book? OK, good. How many of you have uh, read the third edition? A few. So well, this session, is, of course, is all about the book. And I'm going to pick some of my favorites from the previous editions. And of course, we're going to cover what's new in the third edition. And if you haven't read it before, I strongly recommend you to do so. Effect Java has been one of the most important books in my career as a Java developer. And even if you read it before, I still keep opening the book and keep rereading some sessions, uh, sections because it's, it's always hard to remember by heart what well, some difficult things. So like serialization is something a bit complicated. You're always rereading the sessions to be able to do that properly. So. Uh, let's see what we can learn or uh, revisit uh, today. My, uh, my Twitter handle is at Yanaga. Uh, just for uh, um, uh, the curiosity part, I'm Brazilian Japanese, so I'm 100% Japanese, but I was born in Brazil. I also happen to be uh, a Java champion, a Microsoft MVP, and uh, the DevConf rockstar. And this, as far as Google can tell, so far it's a unique combination. And I have a special surprise for you. Uh, today, I brought this very nice Chromebook, which acts as a tablet too. So I brought it as a giveaway. So if you want to try to win this one, I, I, I have a Twitter raffle. So the rules for the raffle is, if you want to take a picture, uh, now this is a very uh, good opportunity. The rules are you have to follow me on Twitter, at Yanaga. You need to take a picture of the session. You need to, uh, to uh, mention my Twitter handle, at Yanago, on the tweet, and the hashtag JFocus. If you did all of that, uh, later in the session, I have a, a Twitter application, which will get uh, all of the tweets and pick a random winner. So take a picture. You have five seconds. Five. Uh, and of course, you have to say nice things about me, OK? <laughs> I have an AI machine learning stuff that will filter the tweets. No, I don't. So uh, uh, last tip, I uh, released this book from O'Reilly, Migrating to Microservices Databases. If you go to this URL, you can get a free copy of the book. But if you go to my Twitter profile, the pinned tweet has a link to the book too. And it, I guess it has been useful. Uh, many people have uh, given good reviews of the book. But uh, if you want uh, to try it, please enjoy. So as I said before, this session is all about affected Java. I have a lot of code to show to you. And it's inter interesting how some very good uh, concepts are shared between great books. So uh, the immutability part, value objects, and other stuff, uh, they, they match very well with some concepts shared with domain-driven design, which is another great book that is uh, more than 10 years old. If you didn't read it, I recommend uh, this, uh, this book to you too. And what's new in the third edition? In, thir in the third edition of Effective Java, we were able to cover lambdas, streams, optionals, default methods and interfaces, try with resources. So this is some of the things that I'll try to cover. I don't know if I have enough time for everything. And I also picked some of my favorites to be able to present to you today. Uh, factory methods, try with resources, equals, hash code to string, comparable, Minimize mutability and enums, which is by far my favorite feature from Java. But instead of just talking about code, I want to really show you some code. So let's try to do some live coding. And I know it's very challenging because people are always ex expecting you to fail when you're doing live coding. But let's see if I can do it properly. Oops. OK, so you can see my screen. Let's try to start with minimize mutability. So let's create a value object class. For example, phone number, which I moved it to the wrong package. Just let's OK, 
So if I want to minimize mutability, let's try. Let's see, say that I want some properties. I want an area code, and I'm going to declare them as final. It's going to have a number. If I want to initialize them as final, I need a, a constructor. If I want a constructor, of course, the easiest way for, to make it immutable is to provide a private constructor so nobody can instantiate it outside the class. But instead of just uh, renaming it to uh, a private constructor, I want to refactor it. And luckily, most of the IDEs, if not all of them, provide this kind of refactor today. I want to refactor uh, this constructor to a factor method. And some of the benefits of using a factor methods are that, uh, uh, let me see. First, factor methods have a name, so you can uh, give a useful or meaningful name to a factor method. The downside of this is that if you generate the Java docs from this class, you won't have a separate session saying, oh, factor methods, because factor methods are static, uh, are, sim uh, are common, factor methods in the Java language. But if you want to provide a true immutable classes, you need to check the error code and the number if the values are correct, because you should never create an object with, a, with a, an inconsistent state. So let's see if I could use like a, a method. Error code should be greater than 100. And check argument number should be greater than 1,000. And where does this method come from? Uh, in this code, I'm using the Guava library. And I know some people curse me for that, but uh, the, because Guava in the past has had some trouble with backward incompatibility, which they promised to fix. To be honest, I didn't uh, change any new projects using the Guava library in the past two years, so I don't know how it's work going on. But if you have any feedback, please report to me. I'm more than happy to, to share it uh, uh, too. But if you look at the source code of the check argument methods, it's a very simple method. It just check, checks the Boolean arguments and throws new illegal argument exception if it doesn't, it's not true, which is the proper uh, exception to be thrown if you have an illegal argument in your method. Okay. So I'm checking the argument, and why should I be checking it when I'm creating? Well, if you create, uh, if you check the arguments of your objects when you're creating the methods, you're just trying to, to do a fast fail argument because it's much easier for you to detect the problems in your code when you receive the arguments rather than you're using. So it's very common for us in our business code. We just keep our our uh, business objects. We just get have a lot of getters and setters. We modify the states, and later during runtime, we get a bug uh, with inconsistent states, and we don't know how the object reached that inconsistent state because our, our, our objects have too much area for uh, mutability. And one of the ways to prevent this very hard to, to solve problems is to minimize the mutability, and this is one of the ways that you can achieve that. Another benefit of uh, factor methods is that you are not required to always create a new object. If you want, for, for example, to reuse some of the objects, suppose that the creation of this object is a very expensive uh, a computational code. So instead of creating the object every time somebody passes the same arguments, you just want to create an internal cache and always return the same instance when you receive the same arguments. This is an implementation of the flyweight design pattern, and it's, uh, it solves you. Uh, uh, it can solve you a lot of, uh, of time when trying to create new objects. Okay, and you have the added, added benefit if you're implementing the flyweight design pattern, you always return the same instance. So later, if you want to compare two instances of the object, you can use the equals operator instead of e using the equals method for, for the comparison. That's another benefit. Okay, And the last thing that I want to tell you is that factor methods are not required to return always the same type of the object. Suppose, for example, that we were using constructors and later we decided to evolve our code. Well, now I have phone number, I have an internal phone number, and I have an international phone number. If I decide to use constructors and later I decide to create this hierarchy of, of classes in my code, I would need to go uh, in my source code and check in the every single time I'm using the constructor, well, now I need to create an internal phone number or international phone number. If I'm using a factor method, I wouldn't need to change anywhere in my code. I would just need to change a single point, the factor method, and, and put the business logic around which type of object would I need to create inside the method. So I could just, like for example, put a simple condition if the area code is greater than 900, for example, just return a new international phone number. Right? As long as phone number 
is a child, international phone number is a channel phone number, I wouldn't have any issues. And even later, if I wanted to refactor this code, for example, I want to change this phone number from a class to an interface, it would be easy because now with Java, since Java 8, we can use like this kind of factor methods in interfaces too. So it's, it's very easy for me to evolve this code if I'm using factory methods. Okay. But if I want this to be a proper value object, there are some fundamental uh, methods that I need to implement uh, in my class. One of them is equal, the other one is hash code, just to start with the basics. So if I want to implement this, for example, one possible implementation, instance of a number, Oh. Oh. Come on. It's always hard typing in front of such a big audience. Okay, so this is one of the possible implementations of the equals method if you don't care about performance. One of the problems of this method is that we know that area code and number are primitive types, but you're using this, this method, which, by the way, the first implementation that I saw of object.equals was from Guava, but very nice things use, usually, uh, uh, these ideas usually get shared. So since Java 7, I guess, we're able to use the objects um, uh, class from the Java U2 package, so we can use the equals methods. And, but uh, as I said before, if we don't care about performance, it's okay. But if we do care about performance, and we know that there are primitive types, we should be using return this area code equals to other dot area code. The benefit of using equals is that it tests for nullability from both arguments. So you won't have a no pointer exception or you have to to provide that business, uh, that complex uh, logic for trying to compare. If this is equals to new, the other equals to new, or something like that, you just use objects.equal. Okay? And another possible optimization, if you're frequently using your object in comparisons, you could just say, well, if object equals to this, return true. It's a very cheap and very nice optimization. If you're comparing it to, you, to yourself, uh, it should be uh, always be true. And for the hash code part, Again, luckily, in since Java 7, we have obelisk.hash, area code, this dot number. We can return. You should always be comparing the hash code properties, uh, properties in the same order that you're comparing the equals in the equals methods. You should always be using the same properties in both equals and hash code. And this is a very nice implementation, again, if you don't care about performance, because you have two problems here. First, area code and number are primitive types, which means that you need to box and unbox, which is a, uh, an expensive operation. And you need to create an array. Since you have a var arcs, uh, method, you need to create an array, which is another computational expensive uh, uh, operation. So uh, what could you do? If you go to the book, uh, Joshua Block suggests like uh, an implementation that uh, is good for most of the time. So you could hard code that. You could also ask your ID to generate your code. Uh, one of the downsides of asking your RDE, I've seen many people falling uh, with this. You just later, you just decide to evolve your code. You add another property to your, to your class. You change the equals method, but you forget to add that property to the hash code. Then you have this bug, and you don't know where, where is it coming from. So that, that's one of the problems. You could be using some compile time libraries or runtime libraries. Uh, I don't. I don't have a, a particular opinion. I'm very old school. I'm from the time where, when these tools didn't work properly, so I prefer to code it myself. But I can totally admit that it's error prone. But if you want to use some automated options, of course, you could be using Lombok. You could be using uh, Immutables. You could be using Google Auto. These are some libraries that would allow you to implement your value objects, immutable value objects, with proper equals and hash code implementation. And since this object is immutable, you didn't even need to compute this hash code every time. You could just have uh, created, like, for example, a final final and say that this dot hash and just return the hash every time it's being invoked. 
Okay? And that's one of the other reasons. If you're using any kind of class that you're creating as a key to a hash map or inside a hash set, they should be immutable. Because I've been burning by this bug uh, many times in my career, you just add, added a, an object to a hash map, later you query by the same uh, key, and you get a no object. And why is that? If I, I just put that thing on the hash map, well, uh, you had a mutable object, you change the properties, the hash code changes, and it doesn't work anymore in a hash map or in a hash set. You just added that object in a hash set, you ask if the hash set contains that object, and it's false because you changed the hash code. So uh, it should always be immutable. Okay. Uh, what else can we do here? We can also implement two string, and I've seen people implementing two string uh, to present like business strings, which is the wrong way of doing. Two string should be a thing for developers. So if you want to know or debug or to, or to log something, and you want to know what's happening with your code, that's what this two string methods for. So again, I'm going to use a Guava class to create this, but you know, of course, you can create your own or use another library. If I want to create a meaningful to string, I could say, well, area code and pass this property. I could say also number, number and to string. And how is the true string method? So if I just decide phone number of, I say 200, oops, 200 and 2000 and uh, so. Let's see how it works. So if I run it, you can see this beautiful string is everything you need to debug your code or just to uh, debug in your IDE, just do a mouse over here, you get this meaningful string, you know what's happening in your code, it shows you the internal state of the class. But if you want to present a business string to your users, you, know, you should be implementing other methods. You can, of course, create your own interface for that, or you can reuse a Java interface, which has been around since Java 6, I guess. Uh, you could use Formatable, which is a very nice way for you to provide your business strings. You can provide internationalization, different alternate formats inside this method. It has a very big Java doc, so you can use all the parameters to format your code. I strongly recommend you to do so, but here I'm going to provide a very simple implementation. Suppose that I want just to format and separate the, the area code and the number. So here, and what's the difference? Instead of using print line, I'm going to use a print. F, and let's see what's the difference between both implementations. So here, I have a two-string method which will provide me, a, which will provide a developer string for me. And here, I have the, the formatable interface, which will provide me, I, as long as I use a formatter, a printf, to print the string, will provide me with the business string. And I can have multiple different alternate formats for that. Uh, another, um, so that's how, how you should be doing business string. And another important thing to notice is that I'm clearly providing a string, a business string, which has a separate uh, separation between the values. So I have the area code and the number. And if I'm doing that, I need to provide the getters for area code and number. And I, in the beginning, I didn't like this approach because basically it feels that I'm breaking the, the encapsulation. But on the other hand, if I don't provide these getter methods, what will happen is that some, some other very smart developer will figure out, well, now I need the error codes. Oh, the business string provides me the error code. What they will do, they will parse this business string to just get the error code. And later, someone, somebody decides to change the requirements. Oh, now we're going to change the format of the of phone number for business value. Now instead of dash, I'm going to put that in parentheses, and all of the code that were used to parse this business string is going to fail in production. You can't even have a compile time error, it's going to be a runtime error. So again, if you're providing uh, in, a in any way a string where you have the value separated, you should be providing the getter methods for that information. And uh, what else? Well, maybe we have a phone number. Maybe we want, uh, would like to compare these phone numbers between one and the other so we could sort them out. So we could implement a comparable interface. Comparable. So I want my phone numbers to be comparable. And in this case, I need to compare them. 
using the compared to methods. So if I were using Java until Java 7, I could use, for example, there are many libraries for that. I'm just using, again, Guava and an example. You could use a comparison chain and say, I want to compare this area code, or that area code, compare this dot number, or dot number, and get a result. This is a nice implementation because as soon as the, uh, the, the values area code, for example, are different, you have a fail, uh, 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 we have a fast return uh, because you don't need to compare the other values. Uh, but if you're using Java 8, you have a better way of using, of implementing comparisons. So suppose that this is the pre Java 8 codes. But since we have these classes in the JDK, I prefer to use the class from the JDK. You could be using, for example, comparator. And I want to compare, since I know they're primitive int, I'm using comparing int, phone number p, p dot area code, then comparing int, p dot number, and then compare this and the other objects. So this is a Java 8 way of using, using lambdas uh, here, of course, of implementing a comparator. But this implementation is not very efficient because every time I'm calling the comparator, the compare to methods, I'm creating a new comparator. And these comparators are stateless, so it should be thread safe. And so another optimization that I could be doing that if I want to refactor this and extract, uh, extract a constant. So I want phone number comparator. So I just create a thing here. It doesn't need to even need to be public. It could be static. So I created a comparator. I'm just reusing it in every comparison that I make. OK? So these are some of the tips that I wanted to share to you uh, using, of course, the comparator is, uh, is new. And these are some examples of the previous editions of the book with some very few tips that are uh, for myself and from Java A2. What else can we learn from Effective Java? Let me check my time, too. OK. So let's try to get back here. Just quick slides. So we also learned that with Java 8, we have functional interfaces. Functional interfaces can be used in, in Lambda in, in, uh, as Lambdas. And one of the best practices I've learned in the past, if you had like a business logic where you, which used to be the, always the same in the beginning and after the end or after the method, but in the middle of the method, you had some business logic that used it to vary according to a different implementation. So the best way for you to be doing that before Java 8 was to use the, the, the template methods design pattern. But with Java 8, we have a better version uh, of, of this solution. We can use the strategy design pattern instead of the template methods. Okay. But before I dig into that solution, I have to tell you that uh, uh, with the function interfaces provided in Java 8, and let, uh, well, if I'm correct, I counted it again today. In Java, in the, in Java 8, Java Auto function package, you have 41 different functional interfaces. And you, as a Java developer, should be aware of all of these 41 functional uh, uh, interfaces to be able to be a uh, proficient. Uh, a Java programmer. But you don't have to worry about learning all of the 41 interfaces. What I have to tell you, the tip is that if you learn only the six functional interfaces, you'll be covering almost, if not all, of the use cases. And why is that? Because you have this, for example, unary operator, which is a functional interface that receives an argument of type T and returns a result of the same type T. You have unary operator, which is uh, a generic interface. You have int unary operator. You have boolean. Oh, uh, you have a double unary operator. You have float unary operator. You see, you have many variations just for the primitive types, uh, for performance reasons. So if you learn what a unary operator does, if you have a primitive type, you just have to go and check the right interface for the primitive type. Okay. So going forward, binary operator takes two arguments of type T, returns a result of type T two. Uh, predicate. Uh, receives a type T, returns true or false. Functions receives a type T and returns a type R, which is usually used as a mapper function. You, you receive an argument and you transform that argument to another thing. You have also supplier, 
which receives no argument and returns a type T, and you also have a consumer which receives a type T and returns void. These are the six basic functional interfaces. And you might be wondering, is there any case which I could be providing my own function interface? Well, maybe, but you should be thinking twice, or at least, or three to four times before creating your own function interface, because, well, Java developers, they already have to learn 41 different functional interfaces. If you create a new functional interface in your code, that's another interface that developers need to be used to to be able to be proficient uh, using your code. And if you and it's very likely that the function interface that you're creating is just a type of a uh, variation of, uh, on, of an already existing function interface. For, so for example, if instead of creating a bank account unary operator, you could be providing or asking for a unary operator of type bank account. It's, it's much easier for, for developers to learn that. And one of the things that I've learned also in the past, when people are creating their function interfaces, because, well, this interface only has only have, uh, one argument, or only has two arguments. No, maybe I want to provide a function interface that have more than two arguments. Well, maybe you should be thinking twice. Uh, that's too many arguments for a function interface. Okay, so some of the tips. And if you want to create a function interface, let's see. For example, I want to declare a new to my functional interface. And here, and I want to provide a very good method to something, which should never do because it returns nothing and receives no arguments. It's a very silly method. Uh, but if you want to use this as a lambda, you should be, for example, uh, be annotating your your interface with at functional interface. And why is that? I'm the developer. I'm developing my code. I know that I, I, it's supposed to be used as a functional interface. I'll only provide one abstract method in my interface. But why should you be annotating? Well, later, six months later, another developer, maybe even you, uh, could be deciding, oh, I have this functional interface. It would be really nice if I could add another method. If you add another public int. You decide to add another method. If you don't have that function interface, your code will compile. And if you didn't have, if you're providing a library and you didn't uh, provide like proper tests or something, or if you're not using your function interface inside your code, your code would even compile. But people outside your library are using this interface as a function interface, and their code will fail because you added another method. So it's a very good practice to add this add function interface. So if you add another method, a non-abstract. Uh, uh, if you add an abstract method, another abstract method to your interface, your code will fail at compile time. So this is a good practice, okay? So what else can we do? Let's try to look how we use to implement the template method pattern. So my template methods implementation. So if I public void do something. If I used to say, oops, if I used to have a method and it used to do a very complicated thing before and another very complicated thing after, and I used to have something that would vary here, I would say, well, get string. Okay, and this particular method would be an abstract method, so I would provide. String. So, protected. What am I missing? Abstract. Thank you. I knew. I just was checking with you. Okay. So, I have this abstract method. So, if I want to provide different implementations, I class one template implementation extends my templates. So if I want to get string, it will provide me, oops, C. If I want just to run this, I could provide, for example, my template new dot do something. One template, oh, come on. Do something, if I want to run it, 
Yeah, I would have the template implementation. I could provide another implementation, just change the thing that the string that is being returned. I would have like the same thing in the beginning, same thing in the end, and I would vary the implementation. This is the way we used to do before Java 8. Now that we have Java 8, we can do the same thing in a much cleaner way using the strategy design patterns. So my strategy implementation. So here, I could uh, just copy paste the same thing, like do something, just to save some time. I'm doing something here, say get string, but instead of providing an abstract method, I could just provide final, I want to provide a supplier. And the supplier of a string, because that's what I'm using. And of course, I want to provide a constructor with the supplier. I could even provide and refactor that with a factor method. So instead of using get string, I could just reuse it and say, well, supplier.get. So, and when I'm trying to use this implementation, I could say, oh, I want to provide my strategy implementation of, and now I want to provide using a lambda C. And I want to have another implementation providing D. And just to be, to be a separation here, and if I decide to run this thing, of course, it didn't work because I didn't ask to do something. Now if I run it again, you can see I have two different implementations. My code is much simpler. Uh, it's questionable, but I think it's much more elegant. I have this Lambda as a supplier. I'm providing the, the part that varies as a Lambda argument instead of having to create a new class and uh, implement the abstract methods, OK? So this is the Java way for you to be varying this operation. So instead of template methods, use Java 8 function interfaces with the strategy design pattern, right? So what else can we do? OK, so let's jump into, since we're talking about uh, Java uh, lambdas and these kind of things, I want to provide you some tips about using method references. So method reference, another way of for, for you to provide uh, the, the lambdas in, in the Java language. So, and uh, the Factory Java book argues that you should try to use method reference every t most of the times instead of using lambdas. And for you to be able to do that, there are five different types of method reference in the Java language. And I'm going to show uh, them to you so you can learn to use them uh, later. So for example, suppose that I want to use a, a static method reference with the simplest possible one. So if I want to use this static. And suppose I here, as an argument, I have a function that receives a string and returns an integer. So basically, I'm receiving a string. And I want to return that as an integer. I could use a method for, for example, integer parse int and provide this string, OK? So this is the lambda version of using uh, this static uh, this uh, implementation. If I want to convert that, 100% uh, of the IDEs these days is provided for refactoring autom automatically. You can just replace this lambda with a method reference. So the method reference syntax for this particular use case for the static me uh, method reference is name of the class, Column, column, name of the methods. Okay, so and it might look weird in the beginning, but if you get used to the syntax, it's much easier for you to uh, learn uh, to learn and read the code later. So instead of using this, I'm providing a static method reference. This is the simplest possible type of method reference. Second type, I can have uh, an unbounded method reference. How does it work? Unbounded means I'm going, uh, it's uh, unbound to a particular instance. I'm going to apply the operation on the same instance that I'm receiving as an argument. So suppose that I have here a parameter, a unary operator of a string. I'm receiving a string, and I want to return a string too. So if I'm receiving a string, maybe I want to convert this string to lowercase or uppercase. So I could say to lowercase, OK? How is the, the unbounded version of the method reference? I could, again, I can just refactor this instance and replace with name of the class, 
colon, colon, to lowercase, which means that since it's an unbounded method reference, doesn't matter which argument you are giving to me, I want to apply and uh, want to call this method to lowercase on the same instance that I'm receiving as an argument. That's an unbounded method reference, okay? Third type of method reference, and this is the most complicated one, it's the bounded method reference. So if I want to have a bounded method reference, here I have a predicate which, uh, of ty uh, type instance, which means that I, I need to receive an instance and return either true or false. So the lambda version, and uh, disclaimer, these versions are not uh, bytecode equivalents, so that's why IDs can't refactor uh, your code with the, the example that I'm showing to you. So if I have an instance, I want to say, I want to get a specific instance of an object which is being returned by this method now, and I want to apply uh, to use this instance to call this method is after. Okay? So what's happening here? I'm calling instant.now, I'm getting this instance, and I'm calling the is after method on this particular instance, and I'm using this thing that I received as an argument as the parameter of the method. This is a bounded, this is, this is going to be a bounded method reference. So, for, so far it's a lambda. So, how do I convert it to a bounded method reference? I just say instance. Now, I want to use this instance that is being returned in here. Column, column is after. And I want to call this method on this particular instance that is being returned. This is a bounded method reference, and this is the most complicated one. To be very honest, it's not that common for you to be using this in your code, but you need to know that it's a possibility. Okay? And you can tell that the IDs can't refactor that this code automatically because it's not bytecode equivalent. Okay? Uh, later, uh, fourth type, you can have a constructor. Uh, uh, method reference. So here I have a supplier which, which uh, receives nothing and needs to return for me a new tray map of uh, string string. So that, how does it do? I could be providing, well, if I provide a lambda, I'm receiving nothing and I want to return a new tree map. Okay, but I could also be using this as a method reference, a constructor method reference. So I'm refactoring this automatically. I just have to use this very neat syntax, which is tree map colon colon new. This is a constructor method reference. But of course, since you know that using factor methods is better than using constructor, you'll probably be more tempted to convert this constructor if it's one of your classes to a factor method and just call a static uh, method reference. Okay. But if you're using a third-part library or a JDK class like Remap, you need to use a constructor. This is one of the ways where you can use a constructor method reference. And last one, array method references. Yeah, here I have a function. I'm receiving an integer, and I want to return an array uh, of uh, int. So what I'm receiving an integer, and I want to return new int. How can I convert this to a method reference? I just Using the refactor, again, I have the type of the array, int, uh, colon, colon, new. That's how you provide a method reference for uh, arrays. And you probably can, we could, could probably arg argue that the method reference version is much cleaner for to, to read than the lambda, the lambda version. When maybe you shouldn't be using method references, well, maybe if you have a static method reference and you know that the name of the class is a very, very, very big and complicated thing that would uh, suppose that you're getting a, a Spring class which has like uh, abstractive factory, proxy advisor and something, and you have a very like 250 characters, you don't want to use that. Maybe you want to use uh, a lambda. So that's some of the, the questions that you need to ask yourself before refactoring, but I, again, I would say that most of the times a method reference is much cleaner for you to see. Okay. Ten minutes. So let's try now to play with my favorite uh, Java feature, which is enums. Suppose that I, have, I want to provide a singleton, and many people used to do in the past, like this private static final thing, and try to initialize the, the singleton instance. Well, if you read the book, you know that the best way for you to create a singleton using an enum and just declaring this single instance. 
right? And why is that? Because in the Java language, enums are full featured classes. You can do everything that you, could, you can do in a normal class in, a, uh, in an enum with the additional of limited instantiability. And the nice thing is that you learn that serialization in Java is very complicated to do properly. If you're using an enum, you have ser serialization implementation for free. So one of the bugs that is, is not that uncommon especially in complicated situations that, oh, I created my own singleton, uh, but I'm serializing and deserializing this object, and suddenly I have a singleton, but I have more than one instance of my singleton. So it breaks the, 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 the purpose of using a singleton if you don't implement uh, serialization property, uh, proper, properly. But if you're using enums, you don't have to worry about that. And if you ever show a Java enum to, for example, to a C Sharp developer, he or she will be very jealous because in other, most of the other languages, enums are just constants that you declare in your code. In Java, they are full featured classes. So, one of the greatest things that I've learned in the Effective Java book. Second edition was that you could provide polymorphic operations using enums with a limited instantiability. So suppose that I wanted to make here operation, the basic mathematical operations, and I wanted to provide, for example, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And I want it to be polymorphic. So I could say public, abstract, int, apply, and I wanted this to be implemented as a polymorphic operation, I could just implement this method into each one of my enums. So I could say x plus y. And this was one of the best ways for you to show to your colleagues that you were very smart because you read uh, this section of the fact job book in the night before. Oh, let me show you some tips. And you just saw, and they would be all impressed with, oh, I didn't know that enums did that. Well, that's true. So, so you could apply and divide. So this is the pre-Java 8 version of you doing this kind of polymorphic uh, operation. So you can see it's a kind of variation of the template methods. But here I have an abstract method. I'm just implementing inside each one of my operations, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. If I want to refactor this code to a much better version since Java 8, I could be using the strategy design pattern again. How can I do that? I'm going to say that I'm going to add the fields, private final, int binary operator and operator. And I want to provide a constructor. And instead of having here an abstract implementation, I could say, well, apply method will return operator apply as int x and y. Okay. So instead of having this very uh, ugly implementation here, Online, I could just provide a parameter in my enum construction. And I could, of course, since we're using Java 8, I can use lambdas to be doing that. I could say, well, you want to receive two int x and y, and you want to implement this x plus y. Subtract, I will do the same thing. I just provide as the constructor uh, x and y, x minus y. If I want to multiply, x and y, and if I want to divide the last operation, x and y. Okay, This is the Java way of doing the exactly same thing, and I would argue with you that this version is much cleaner. It's much easier for you to code and also to read the implementation. And you might be um, uh, questioning me, well, you only were, we were only capable of doing this because the, your operation is too simple. Like uh, in the real world, my business logic would be much more complicated. I can't fit that in a one-liner lambda. Oh, maybe you can. Suppose, for example, that the add operation was very complicated. It would took like a lot of lines of code, and you wouldn't be able to provide this as a lambda because it would become very ugly. Well, you could use a method reference to be doing that. So let's try to create another class. For example, addition, and maybe you, oops, you want to provide here 
int apply. And you have this. So you have a very complex operation here. And you just return x plus y. So this is your multi-line business logic that wouldn't fit in a lambda. But you just created another class. You implement your business logic. Of course, this one needs to be static. And you want to reuse this inside your enum. What can you do? You can just go here. Instead of providing this lambda, I can go and replace. Well, let's use a method reference. Addition, colon, colon, apply. And you achieve the very same effect. You have a polymorphic enum using the strategy design pattern and using a method reference because my code is too big to fit in a one liner uh, lambda. And OK, and that's, uh, we're about to, we still have five minutes left. That's, uh, I just wanted to wrap. Uh, the, the presentation for what I have to share with you today. I, don't, uh, I could dig into more complicated topics. It would take more than time. If you have any questions, I'll be available uh, after the session. And of course, I'm pretty sure that you, all, you only waited for me until now because you want to know the result of the raffle. So let's try to check. OK, so here I have this, uh, if you go to my GitHub, uh, the source code of this application is available on GitHub. You just have to trust me that uh, I'm running the same implementation that is available there. So if I go here, my application is raffle.yanaga.io. And if we want to zoom it, I'm going to say that here the hashtag is jfocus. And you need to mention my Twitter handle, at Yanaga. And there can be only one winner. Okay. Oh, I forgot to mention in the rules, the winner needs to be present. Okay. Or else somebody on the live streaming will try to cheat or something. Okay. So, and let's see who is the winner. Olaf, are you here? Okay. Let's see if you said a nice thing about me. Okay. Okay. Congratulations and thank you very much. Okay.